Welcome to the Strong Single and Human podcast, a real look at single parenting, how to navigate the ups and downs of life with kids on your own while keeping sane. We cover all manner of subjects from domestic violence, dealing with childhood trauma, through to fussy eaters and how to help your kids become resilient. I'm your host, Claire Martin. Welcome. This week's guest obtained her bachelor's degree in psychology in 1987 from the University of Maryland and a master's degree in social work in 1993 from the University of Maryland as well at Baltimore and has been in clinical social work for 30 years. In addition to this, she decided to join the army at the age of 42, she insane, Uh, because she wanted to be part of something bigger than herself. And during her time, served in Afghanistan from 2008 to 2010. She is an expert in the following topics. Anger management, anxiety, coping with chronic pain, depression, domestic violence, eating disorders, grief, loss, low self-esteem, parenting, relationships, stress, substance abuse, trauma, women's issues, and work issues. Well, she's been in the game for 30 years. And she has provided trauma services for Hurricane Katrina, 9-11, bank robberies, military deployment, and has helped children and teens cope with academic challenges, bullying, divorce, peer pressure, and low self-esteem. This is the Strong, Single and Human podcast. Welcome, Elaine. Welcome back to the podcast. How are you? It's great to be back. It's great to see you. Yes, I know. I know. Look, for people who didn't listen to the last episode, can you just give us a brief synopsis around like who you are, why? And why I'm, why you're on the podcast as such? Why am I talking to you? Okay, so um, I've been a clinical social worker for thirty years. Uh, most of that at private practice, doing psychotherapy. Um, I have my own private practice um, for the past twelve years. Um, before then, um, I joined the army at the age of forty-two, and I had the opportunity to. I know. Wow. <laughs> Um, to work both in garrison, um, handling domestic violence cases, and then overseas in Afghanistan, where I uh, saw soldiers on an outpatient basis. And then I was also the XO for medical command for all of Afghanistan. Um, Yeah, people are always like, at 42, why? Right. And, you know, since I was very young, I always wanted to be part of something bigger than myself and make a larger impact. It's just always been a passion of mine. It's like part of my DNA, that idea about making a difference. And what was funny about it is once I joined uh, the army, I met a lot of people who felt the same way. They totally got it. Yeah. And then it was funny because then the army put out a commercial where it had this young woman who was telling her parents why she wanted to go into the military. I don't remember which branch it was. And she said exactly the same thing because I want to make a bigger impact. I want to be part of something bigger than myself. So. Wow. I know, but it's such a, it's such a life changing thing to do. Especially since I didn't have any military in my background and my family. Yeah. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought this really fits, you know, me. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so then you did all of that within the military and then you came out and still continue to do sort of like dealing with trauma and things like that as well. Yeah. So in my private practice and I had I did private practice work before I went into the army, really. Um, um, I've, I've been fortunate, though, that I've had an opportunity to work in a variety of settings like in um, you know, a psychiatric hospital, a women's center, um, a group private practice, you know, the military, of course. Um, and um, so in my my own private practice, I just do a variety. I, I see all populations. 
Um, and I have a very eclectic approach, meaning, you know, I do cognitive behavioral, I do insight oriented, um, you know, you, you name it. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. And, um, so, but you also had a daughter as well. Yes. She is 20 years old. She actually is on the spectrum. Um, she has Asperger's, what they used to call Asperger's, high functioning autism. Um, and uh, she was diagnosed back in middle school. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. But how old was she when you joined the uh, army? About five. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. When I deployed, that was that first month was the hardest. I just kept looking at her picture and sobbing. <laughs> Um, but you know, that first month is the hardest and then it goes by really fast, but, um, no, I, I'm so proud of her. Um, she's now, um, a sophomore in college. She's majoring in communication arts. Wow. She's a really good artist, a digital artist, and she's, uh, just blossomed so much. Um, you know, in talking about parenting, you know, as part of this podcast is about parenting and it's, I think that you know, some listeners will be able to relate to this. You never know until, you know, they grow up and you have a chance to see how they turn out that you're like, okay, I did. I I made the good, I made the right right. choices. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, when she graduated, I know, I know. You know, which is above a 4.0. That was, I think the first time I was like, you know, I can take a deep breath. Okay. Right. It's like baking a cake, isn't it? You put all of these ingredients in there and then you like, yeah, I like put that it analogy. in the oven, send it yeah. off to college. And then, and then you go, okay, I'm not sure how mm-hmm. this is going to turn mm-hmm. out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. No, wow. And I have three, wow. um, I, I have my own podcast um, and uh, yes. it's called, it's more complicated than you think. And there's three episodes on there called parenting 101 that I highly recommend listening to is pretty much everything that I uh, teach parents when I work with parents. And so, um, you know, that that will give you a really good idea of a lot of the interventions that we used with our daughter. Yeah, 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 no, that's fair. That's fair. Well, today we're going to talk about people pleasing because I think a lot of situations and circumstances that I actually, um, where I've spoken to people, single parents and stuff, um, what I find is that one of the single parent is tends to be a people pleaser in all various different ilks, you know, like various different levels of people pleasing, um, and that people like it, they can get into real problems with the conversations that they have in their head, even though they're seeing red flags, that they're having these conversations in their head and like justifying these red flags and being a people pleaser um, sort of doesn't help in that sort of situation as such. Yeah. And I just thought like me and you have been, we'd been talking about this and unpacking that idea um, when we, when we spoke previously and I was like, I'd really like to do a podcast episode on people pleasing because I think, once you actually understand one, what it is and why it happens and then how you can, um, how you can basically stop the habit of people pleasing or how it's not actually giving, it's not helping your situation, then, um, then you can actually make better choices, recognize situations that may be toxic for you and move on basically. And, improve your relationships i'm hoping right. would i be right in saying yeah, that absolutely i've said a lot there yeah well you know over the years one of the things that i have discovered is almost everybody ruminates they have this inner dialogue that you described and i've even identified um the five i call it you know five sort of types of ruminating it's mind reading, like, what is this person thinking about me, you know, right? Um, uh, second guessing, why did I do that, you know, or rehashing, like, maybe I should have done it this way. Um, anticipating, 
like what is this person going to think or how, or how are they going to feel or how are they going to react, um, you know, based on what I do, uh, comparing yeah. yourself to others. And then um, the, the piece de resistance is uh, self-criticism, right? I'm stupid. I'm, yeah. oh, you should hear young girls when I work with, you know, teenage girls and I have this one exercise that I do with them where I have them get in touch with their inner critic. I'm stupid. I'm ugly. I'm worthless. I'm annoying. I mean, it's just, wow. it's heartbreaking. It's oh, and I'm, and while you were saying that, right, I just sat here and thought, do you get the same thing with boys though? Um, you know, at first I used to think that it was more women than men. Um, yes. And I, I do think, and I can explain why I do think that women tend to be more people pleasers and harder on themselves. Um, but, but um, I have come to, to uh, realize that, you know, I think most men do this too. Maybe they won't call it people pleasing, but they do that, that negative or internal dialogue or analyzing, you know, they having this, uh, this internal conversation with themselves, right? Yeah, I was just, I was interested. The reason I asked you that question is because society still at the moment has a one expectation conversation with boys and then also girls are still drawing down that media, you know, must be beautiful, must be this, must be that, right, um, sort of avenue. And it's still it's so hard to get society to sort of even the playing Absolutely. fields out. Um, so, yeah, I just wondered if that yeah. was the reason. I have a that the um, sort of blog also. <laughs> it's called uh, Mentally Speaking. And one of the articles in there is um, it, these are mostly articles about current events from a psych perspective. And so there's one in there about uh, the time when Simone Biles was, um, you know, in the, the most recent time she was in the Olympics and she, she bowed out of certain competitions um, and she was so heavily criticized for that. And I thought to myself, this is. So this person is an expert in her field, right? There is nobody that's better at what she does than her. And we have people out there questioning her decision, right? Who aren't And I thought, what an insult that is to, you know, and, and, it, and it really fits in with this idea about women, you know, trusting their instincts, Right? Yeah. And and when I saw her do um, a, um, a, a um, um, you know, a, a pest conference. Right. Um, and I was thinking to myself, this woman gets it. She knows how to self-validate. You know, um, she's not looking for anyone's permission. Right. And and that's what we. Uh, as women in particular, I think need to do a uh, learn how to do, but you're right. It's very much reinforced by our culture. And it's also compounded by the fact that women are more relationship oriented. We just innately are right. Well, and yeah. so that's where we get a lot of our self-confidence from. And it's, it's also, you know, historically, when you think about where women were allowed to, you know, to spread their wings. It was in very, you know, inherently nurturing types of jobs, right? Nursing, teaching, you know, parenting, secretary, right? And um, and so we tend to define ourselves very much from that place, right? Um, and, and so when our relationships are in some way endangered, then that affects how we feel about ourselves, right? So, so if we if we can go back to you know this concept about people pleasing, right? Yeah, I was going to say, what um, is it? Um, right. So, so the the biggest mistake that people make as a whole in our society is that um, 
we take this um, this inner dialogue sort of at face value, right? Okay. Um, and then we we analyze it or we argue with it. So remember, I was talking about this these five types of ruminating, right? What I want people to understand first and foremost is that all of that is a coping mechanism. It is a choice that we make. It's a strategy that we have learned and adapted, right? As a child. Um, as a way of, yeah. And, and, and um, it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we don't focus enough on mental health. And so feelings are not something that people understand. They know what to do with, they know how to cope with it, right? Um, and so what we do is we tend to cope with it by trying, cope with our feelings by trying to talk ourselves out of it or mm -hmm. analyzing it or just uh, ignoring it or telling ourselves, you know, we shouldn't feel this way you know, or we shouldn't think yeah. that way, right? Or being told, or being told we shouldn't feel that way. Like right. stop crying, I'll give you something to cry about or, you know, all of those things mm -hmm. that were great things that you heard in the 70s and the 60s and all of that stuff when you were a kid growing right. up that was like, you know, children right. should right. be seen and not heard and all of these sort of things. Well, what, again, people don't um, understand or appreciate, you know, as a social worker, I'm very much a pragmatist. Um, and so I'm only interested in what works and what's practical. And the way that I look at feelings is they are practical. They are pragmatic. They are a survival mechanism, you know, just like physical sensation. So if I don't eat for a couple of days, I'm hungry. If I touch a hot burning stove, it hurts my hand. There's a reason for that. It's so that I do something about it, right? If I didn't experience hunger, I could starve myself to death. If I didn't experience pain, I could burn my hand. And so we have feelings for the same reason. They are a survival mechanism. And so um, they are practical. They are there to tell us that there is either a need that's not being met or a threat that we are ignoring. And so the first thing that you want to do when you catch yourself ruminating, you know, talking to yourself, that inner dialogue, is you want to stop and ask yourself, what am I feeling? Because all of that cognitive, you know, uh, you know, uh, processing that you're doing, you know, is actually a way of trying to cope with your emotions, right? But the, the thing is that your emotions in and of themselves are just a symptom, right? To tell you there's something wrong. There's a problem you are ignoring. You know, we all are familiar with fight or flight, right? You know, in terms of talking about anxiety, right? So, you know, that's a perfect example. Why do we feel anxiety? It's to tell us that there is some a threat, right? Or that um, there is something that we're feeling out of control about something, right? And, and so um, we, if we were to ignore that, like, let's say, um, you know, back in caveman days, right? you know, there's a saber tooth tiger, right? Oh, well, you know, I should just ignore, you know, so what? So, so the saber tooth tiger is, is uh, making me, you know, anxious or, or I'm fearful of it. Right. I mean, what happens if we ignore that? Right. <laughs> well, we might right? not survive another um, day. Right. I, you know, one of the, one of the analogies I'll often give uh, my patients is, um, you know, if, um, if, you know, it, it, again, uh, back in the day, you know, if, if a caveman uh, is walking around and, um, you know, starting to get cold out, like, oh, gosh, starting, starting to feel chilly out, you know, um, you know, I think maybe, you know, we need to, to start, you know, maybe gathering some food and, 
um, and finding, you know, hunker down, you know, find a cave where we can hunker down for the winter and yep. get some firewood. Get some and stuff wood. Like that. Right. So in other words, we have feelings as they are practical. They are there to get us to do something, to problem solve and to be proactive, not to go, oh my God, it's getting cold out. What if we freeze to death? What if we starve to death? You know, that's not what yeah. it's for. Right? But so the, but the people pleasing, right? Right. In the sense of the word, does people pleasing mean that it's, uh, we are feeling threatened or vulnerable and therefore our survival mechanism is that we go within the group that we sit within, right, whether that be a family, whether that be friends or whatever, that we feel as though because of the emotions that we're feeling that we please people to enable them to or to to basically prove to them that you need to keep me around because I'm on your side, I'm helping you, I'm doing X, Y, and Z, but it's really around your emotions and things that you're feeling or telling yourself from these, right. you know, well, converse, you internal, know, is that what it out, is? Um, children are innately afraid of abandonment and for good reason, right? Because unlike other species, we're very dependent on our caregivers for a very, very long time. So we can't allow ourselves to be angry, right? Um, at, you know, the people that we depend on. So it's much more easy to, to take responsibility and to blame oneself and to, um, to adapt, right. To, if there's, you know, dysfunction in the family, but, you know, as we were talking about, um, earlier, it's like, why do we hold on to that though? I mean, when we get older and we understand it, why do we hold on to it? So, so, you know, going back to fear, there's three types of fear, fear of harm to self or others, fear of rejection, and fear of failure, right? So in particular, when we're talking about people pleasing, we are talking about fear of rejection and fear of failure. These are innate fears, okay? So then compounding that, what I have found is that almost everybody also struggles with feelings of um, uh, inadequacy. Um, I'm not good enough. I'm not deserving enough. There's something inherently wrong with me, right? So if you take those two things together and you think, okay, I already unconsciously, mind you, feel that I'm not good enough or there's something inherently wrong with me, you know, I'm different than everybody else, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And so, and you, and then you experience fear of rejection or failure. What are you going to do? Right. Um, is you're going to think, well, I'm not good enough the way that I am, that I can just uh, be myself. Right. I, I, uh, I know that because of my, you know, because I'm inadequate, that I surely will be rejected. I surely will fail if wow. I don't do something, if I don't overcompensate for it. And so that's where all of the ruminating comes in. It is a way of, of overcompensating to prevent that rejection or failure. It's a way of coping with fear of rejection and failure. Does that yeah. make sense? Yes, it does. It does. It definitely does. So, so then you change yourself to match other people's ideals as such. Is that right? What you, what you believe them to be. I mean, it's, it's, well, it's it, kind I, of like um, we yeah, internalize it's a bit of an, this bully and yeah. we think that we need this bully. Um, yeah. I'll give you a personal example. Um, so I was coming out of Bed Bath & Beyond. This was years ago. I don't remember why, but I just remember um, that, you know, I was feeling self-conscious about something I said or did. And immediately, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. I started to feel anxious and I felt the need to rehash 
what had happened. And I stopped myself and I said, wait a minute, what, what is going on here? Right. And I realized that this was, there was a fear that I had that if I didn't do this, then I would um, surely uh, repeat it and, you know, nobody would like me, you know. In other words, I have to constantly be hypervigilant, constantly be monitoring myself, right? Constantly be adjusting because I'm not good enough the way that I am. I mean, that's what I, I came to the conclusion was, is this was stemming from fears that, I'm not good enough the way that I am. And therefore I have to do all of this ruminating, right. To protect myself from failure and rejection. Yeah. Because you're, what you're doing is you're going back over rehashing what was said and all of those sort of things and mm-hmm. various different other. Right. Ruminating. And what I ended up skills. doing is I, don't I know said if it's to skills. myself, <laughs> I'm going to get in my car. Yeah. And I'm going to drive away. And I'm never looking back, literally and figuratively. And so it doesn't that, you know, it turned off after that. But what I started to do is become more conscious of it and started engaging in thought stopping. And I told myself, what have I got to lose? I've been doing it this way my entire life. So let's just try. Let's just try for a week and see what happens. If I stop mind reading, stop second guessing myself stop anticipating other people's reactions, stop comparing myself to others and stop self-criticizing, right? What's the, I can always go back to it, but. How do you do it though? Because like I sit there and I go, I mean, okay, okay. With things like um, you can stop comparing yourself. My view is that to me, that's pretty easy but i don't know if it is but um because you just go i'm not gonna i'm happy with me i'm not gonna compare myself with other people etc but then how do you stop how do you stop the other ones like how do you stop rehashing stuff and going over things in your head because right so the the thing that uh that is important to understand is that all of that is a coping mechanism for, for feeling insecure about yourself, right? So remember, we got to separate out feelings from how we cope with feelings. There's no such thing as a wrong or bad feeling. It's how we cope with it, right? So feeling insecure, right, is the underlying issue. And so it's about finding another way of coping with those feelings of insecurity besides overcompensating, right? Besides doing all the ruminating. And so what I teach my patients is how to self-validate, right? Um, so let me just, one other thing to that ties into this, this whole dynamic is something called mirroring. So um, when, when we're growing up, Uh, the role of a parent is to be what we call a mirroring object. That is how the parent reacts to their child is how that child gets a sense of self, self self-worth, competence, all of that, right? So if a child, let's say a boy uh, falls off his bike and he comes running home to his mom and goes, mommy, I fell off my bike. And the mom says, well, you should be more careful next time. I mean, not earth shatteringly inappropriate, right? But compare that to, well, that's okay. You know, I know you're a great bike rider and you'll get right back on and you'll do great. And everybody falls off their bikes sometimes, right? That's just normal, right? So consider the reflection that these two parents are providing for that child. So what happens is because most of us grow up in dysfunctional families and we don't get that adequate mirroring, it's either inconsistent or it may be very negative and very dysfunctional. What happens is, is we graduate from our families and we start using other people as mirrors, right? And so everybody does this. 
you are using other people as mirrors for a sense of self. Am I okay? Am I good enough? Am I deserving enough? Right? And if somebody responds to you in a positive way, then you're like, okay, I'm good. Right? But if for one reason or another, you get the sense that you didn't get what you were looking for from them, or it's downright, you know, negative or hostile, what do we do? It's like, oh, what did I, did I do something wrong? You know, is there something wrong with me? Because that's already there. And we're looking to other people all the time for that validation. The problem with that, it's like a cup with a hole in it. No matter how much reassurance, validation, you know, support you get from other people, it's never going to be enough. You're going to constantly be dependent on other people for a sense of self and self-worth. So you have to learn how to plug up the hole. And that's what self-validation is. Okay. So how long does it take to do this exercise as such? Can you fix it like in a couple of months or is it something that's, because I'm thinking, because what you're saying is that everyone, everyone yep. goes through this because yeah, really um, at the end of the day. I don't know if you're day, familiar, but um, there is a book uh, called The Power of Now. It's written by this mindfulness guru. And one of the things that he says in his book is not to be able to stop thinking is a dreadful affliction, but we don't realize this because almost everyone is suffering from it. As it is, I would say about 89 to 90% of most people's thinking is not only repetitive and useless, but because of its dysfunctional and often negative nature, much of it is also harmful. Well, yeah. And I have to agree with you. Um, but then how do you change it to a more positive? So so here's the thing. How right? do you stop? Now, first of all, let me just say something about change, right? Um, there's a, a poem that is um, very uh, near and dear to therapists. Um, it's called uh, the Autobiography in Five Chapters. And, um, and basically, you know, it starts out where I walk down the street, there's a hole in the sidewalk, right? And I fall in and I'm thinking, how did I get here? You know, but somehow we find you find a way out and you go about your business, but then you're walking down the street at, at, at another day and you fall into the hole again. And you're like, I can't believe I'm here again. Right. Until finally the person walks down another street. And that's basically the process of change. It, it, it's a process where first you don't realize you're doing it. Then you catch yourself after the fact. Then you start catching yourself while you're doing it. Then you catch yourself when you're about to do it. And then you stop doing it. Right? That that's why it's called five simple. chapters. Yeah. Right. But it's a process. Right. Um, the other thing about that, too, is one of the things that's a big problem in our culture that we take for granted is that people will change based on um, knowledge, you know, information and reason, right? And I can tell you as somebody who's been doing this work for 30 years, if it were that easy, you would have changed already. But people are way more complicated than they give themselves credit for. To change, it takes insight, problem solving, and coping skills. It's not enough to just have information, right? And for somebody to present it to you in a reasonable way. That's why when somebody's like, you know, this makes no sense. Why are you doing this? Why, you know, this is self-destructive, right? It's because you have to understand why you're doing it, what purpose it's serving, right? What's the underlying problem, the feeling, right? That you're trying to, that you're really, uh, that's really motivating it, right? That, you know, the seed for change is insight. Right? And so, so, but it's too easy ahead. then, I suppose, because that sounds pretty complicated, all of those sort of things. Exactly. And so therefore. Um, all of this, this is complicated. 
Exactly. And this is why people just go, oh, can't be bothered to deal with it. And they just continue doing the same thing again and again. I think they, they keep doing it is because you don't know what you don't know. Because, you know, we don't talk about this stuff. People don't have this perspective. They don't look at feelings as something that is a survival mechanism. That's something that is practical, right? Um, and they don't recognize that that all of this negative self-talk, right, um, is actually a coping mechanism, right? And that you don't need it. Um, so this is the the other sort of interesting thing um, is that as far as self-validating goes, almost everybody has the ability to do it. That's the good news is you have the ability within yourself to do it. So let me just ask you something, Claire, right? So <laughs> would you ever say to your son, look, son, if you want to avoid rejection or failure, this is what you need to do. You need to mind read. You need to second guess yourself. You need to anticipate other people's reactions. You need to compare yourself to others and you need to self-criticize. No, I wouldn't say any of those to him at all. Why not? Don't you want him to avoid rejection and failure? No. <laughs> no, because I know it's because... Um, I want him to be happy and I want him to be who he is, right? So um, I don't want him to compromise who he is. And I know that in him being who he is, he's not going to please everyone all of the time. You know, at the end of the day, he I want him to be empathetic towards other people um, and to understand that there is stuff that's going on in other people's lives that makes them angry aggressive um upset um you know say things that potentially but uh, that aren't true or whatever or are true in mm -hmm. their situation or in tr are true from um their upbringing right so at the end of the day i sort of sit there and i suppose my self talk to me is i go we well, can't please everyone all of the time and their interpretation of me is their interpretation based on their life, right? Based on what they've experienced, what they've gone through, which might not right. necessarily be the true me, right? So I go, right. you know, thanks. Thanks right. a lot for that feedback. Right. But yeah. And I don't know if I'm okay. doing it. I'm, pff, I'm probably doing right. it all wrong, but. Right. See, the thing is, you know, there is, a, there's so much wise, right? There's all these wise quotes about, you know, self-improvement and, and all these things. And, um, and if, if those things worked, why, why are we where we are? You know, why are so many people unhappy? You know, why are so many young people are, know. you know, committing never, suicide, sit, record numbers. And I, I know, but because, I sit here and I go at my age. Because I go, you can't talk yourself out of right? You can't talk yourself out of this. It's, it's more complicated than that. Yeah. You have to understand it. So, but you, you, you hit the nail on the head. What do we tell other people? Just be yourself. Don't worry about what other th people think. You're great the way that you are, right? Isn't that what we tell other people, right? We would never imagine talking to other people that you care about the way that you talk to yourself right? Most of us would not. And there's a good reason for that. Number one, and because we recognize that all it would do is make the person feel worse. And number two, if you're trying to avoid rejection or failure, how is that helpful? Really? I mean, if your son came home with a, a D on one of his exams, you know, are you going to say, what are you stupid or something? Obviously, you know, why you obviously didn't study enough. Why, why, why did you get this D? Tell me about that. You know, what's going on here? Well, some people would, you, know, you can, there's some parents who would exactly, do exactly. Right. Which but is it's pretty not, scary. It's not constructive. Right. <laughs> no. You would say, okay, let's, let's go over what happened. Let's look at, let's look at what you got wrong. And let's talk about how you prepared for this test. 
and let's learn from it, right? That's how you grow. That's how you change. And that's how you avoid failure, right? You learn from it and you problem solve. So why don't we do that to ourselves though? Like we would do that to somebody else. Fear and insecurity, right? Exactly. Um, So, so what, what I teach people in terms of of self-validation is two things. One is what I call be your own best friend. And the op- the other one is the opposite of the golden rule. So be your own best friend refers to any time you're being hard on yourself. You catch yourself being hard on yourself, right? The first thing you want to do is ask yourself, if I were talking to somebody that I care about, particularly like if you have children, imagine talking to your children the way that you talk to yourself, right? And if the answer is no, I would never talk to my children that way, right? You know, ask yourself, how would you talk to them? What would you say? Because that is the way you should be talking to yourself. Why? Because when we talk to other people, we're operating from a place of our values. We're operating from a place of reason, rational mind. When we're talking to ourselves, we're often talking to from a place of insecurity and fear. It's driven by our insecurities and our fears, right? So we have to get outside of that to get a healthy perspective. So so that's the irony is you know how to self-validate because you do it for other people all the time. Yeah, it's nuts, isn't it? It's nuts. We do it for everyone else apart from the most important person, which is ourselves, and then we berate, belittle, and attack ourselves basically. Um, Because it goes back to what I was saying before. There's a fear that if I don't do this, if I'm not hard on myself, if I don't overcompensate in my relationships with other people, if I don't people please, right? Yeah. And if I don't mold myself into what I think that person expects or wants from me, then I surely will end up alone or flat on my face, you know, failure. And in caveman times, being we don't alone. we trust ourselves that yeah. we're good enough the way that we are. But again, it's just an insecurity, right? It's a coping strategy that we have internalized as a way of overcompensating for fears of rejection and failure. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Right. Okay. So that's so one of the up. so that's one of the ways that we can stop ourselves really is to go, well, hang right. on a minute. I'm talking to myself this way. Would I actually talk to my kids that way? Would I right. not be encouraging my children, et cetera? Well, then why am I doing that to myself? And that's sort of a right. And is that really the way that you avoid rejection and failure? That's the point. Fear of rejection and failure is not the problem. We have feelings for a reason. It's to get us to problem solve, to be proactive. Um, And so we know that if we're trying to help somebody else, that's what we do. We'd say, okay, well, tell me what happened. Let's go over it. What can you do differently? You know, what, what can you learn from this, right? What do you want to do differently next time? It, there's no angst there. There's no beating yourself up. I mean, there's nothing to be gained by making yourself feel bad, beating yourself up. It's just not necessary in order to avoid rejection or failure. Well, and you're not going to improve anything if you don't actually. Yeah, it's not and, about. And you know that because you would never use that technique on other people that you care about. You know what I'm saying? Well, if I want you to avoid rejection or failure, then obviously I've got to criticize you and, you know beat you up and, you know, verbally, right? It's unpacking, it's, it's unpacking the situation, but in a positive way, not in a critical comparative and all of the other negative things that you would do and actually going, yeah. So the, uh, it's the only that you brought that up because that you're, that is so astute because one of the things that I tell people now, I don't know if you're familiar from coming from Australia, but there's this famous, uh, uh, show from the 70s called Columbo. He was this detective. Oh, yes, yes, right? yes, yes. 
And I tell my patients, be like Columbo without the trench coat and the cigar. In other words, be curious, be understanding. And I don't mean understanding. I was like, oh, that's okay. You know, no, I mean, it's not, it's not an excuse to just, you know, ignore our mistakes, but to be, um, you know, objective and just to learn from them and say, what was I thinking? What was I feeling? What, you know, what went on, you know, in my upbringing that kind of led me to make the decision that I made the way that I made it, right? We need to understand, we need information if we want to change and improve, not, there's nothing to be gained by beating yourself up. Um, And let me just, before we forget, so the other type of self-validation is what I call the opposite of the golden rule. Yes, what's that? So we all know what the golden rule is, right? No, treat other what is people it? the way you oh. want to be treated, right? <laughs> so the okay. opposite of the golden rule is you have a right to be treated the way you treat other people. So this is where the mirroring comes in, right? Um, and it refers to anytime somebody else makes you feel bad about yourself, right? The first one is when you're being being uh, hard on yourself, right? Right. But this is when somebody else is making you feel bad about yourself. Then what you want to do is you want to ask yourself, if the situation reversed, would I handle it the same way? Would I say to that person what they're saying to me? Would I deal with it the way they're dealing with it? And 99% of the time, the answer is going to be no. Right. And so that gets back to what you were saying before, Claire, about, you know, Everybody operates from different perspectives, right? And so you have a choice to make, right? Are you going to make decisions based on your values, the way you treat people, or according to how other people, or how people treat you, right? Because they, you know, so that's, that's a way of getting some perspective about gee, did I do something wrong? You know, is there something wrong with me? Um, You know, I shouldn't have done that. Ask yourself, if the situation reversed, what, how would I handle that? How would I treat that person? Yeah. Yeah. It's difficult. Yeah. See, I find that it's difficult and I know how to sandwich and that's that's what you call it in the management world is sandwich criticism, right? So if you're wanting somebody to be aware of what they do, you tend to sandwich it with good things either side. And then the the crux of the thing that you want to actually like make somebody aware is to actually go like um, you go you can say things like, oh, you know, you're really good at X, Y, and Z. You might want to consider um, how you do this. You know, maybe maybe go into a course or whatever. Um, and I know you would be successful at it because of X, Y, and Z, right? So you've sandwiched it, right? Um, to sort of lessen the blow. And I suppose in working situations, when you're at work, um, getting criticism from others uh can be pretty challenging because, you know, if you if you've got a work colleague who just goes, oh, what you did in that meeting was complete nightmare and you shouldn't do that and you should do X, Y, and Z and you should do this, that, and the other, right? Um, It it can be very very confrontational, right, and very, you know, and sometimes I suppose if you're sitting there from a people pleaser's perspective, like what do you do? What do you say? What do you, exactly. how do you handle that? Right. Because somebody has gone, oh, you weren't very good in that meeting and you should have done X and you should have done Y and you should have done this. Right. Um, and usually to buy myself time in those situations, I'll go, thank you ever so much for your feedback. I'll, that gives me something to think about there. I'll, I'll think on, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll unpack what you've said and I leave it. And I just leave it because I go, I don't actually know. (laughs) Because I go, I don't know how to handle that, right? Because I go, well, I'm not 100% sure, one, it was true. Two, you know, uh, that's not my interpretation of the situation and how I was, although I am very conscious of the fact that your own 
perception of situations sometimes aren't accurate. Um, so it's just, it's, it's interesting because I think from a work situation, so many people, um, because you've got to go back and work with that person or you've got to go and so it's very difficult to deal with those sort of things. So, um, yes, and you've touched on a number of things. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, no, no, that's great. Absolutely. You really, really uh, are good at, you know, getting to the crux of these things and uh, bringing up some really important aspects of all of this. So, so first of all, in terms of communication skills, this is one of the reasons why I tell people never use other people as mirrors because most people don't know how to cope with their emotions. They don't cope with their emotions well, and they don't know how to communicate constructively. So when you're using someone else as a mirror, what you're doing is is you're basing your sense of self and your self-worth on dysfunctional coping, right? And dysfunctional communication, right? And we also have to separate out what we're talking about here. There's feedback, right? A behavior. And then there's who you are as a person, your worth, your competence, right? who you are, right? Nobody can tell you that but you. Nobody can tell you what your self-worth is, what your competence is, who you are as a person, but you, right? So if somebody's making you feel bad about yourself as a person, they're doing it wrong, right? Um. And, and and unfortunately, most of the time, because again, we don't teach people how to cope with their emotions and how to communicate constructively. Um, that's a lot of times people don't give feedback um, in a positive, appropriate way. So for the for example, you know, I could say to you, uh, Claire, why are you acting like such a bitch? As opposed to Claire, you know, what you just said, that really hurt my feelings or it, it offended me, but I don't want to make any assumptions. So I'm checking in with you. Is that how you meant to come across? Right. And so what you're doing is you're giving that person an opportunity to explain themselves without making assumptions, but you're also, you're also, um, asserting your feelings and because you have a right to feel the way that you feel, even if the person had good intentions. And I have, I have a whole list that I developed of what I call 15 principles of constructive communication, just to give you an idea of how complicated communication is. Right. And so that's what you're touching on. Um, so, so number one, right. We don't want to ever use other people as mirrors for a sense of self. What I like to say is people are like carnival mirrors. You know, when you go to those carnivals and they have those really warped mirrors, you have to think of people like carnival mirrors in terms of where you get your sense of self and self-worth. Now, in terms of feedback, right, um, you know, that's something different. Um, but again. If the person is making you feel bad about yourself, right, chances are it's the way that they are going about it, right? And, you know, hopefully you can, um, you know, ideally what we want to do is learn how to separate those two things so that we can learn how to communicate with one another and say, you know, hey, let's just, can we, can we separate out, you know, what what you're trying to the feedback that you're trying to give me the constructive feedback that you're trying to give me and the way that you're going about giving it to me right right yeah does that make sense yes no it does it definitely does it's oh, i always find the work situations are difficult because 
one, you're working with a myriad of different people. They're not necessarily who you're friends with or who you would even be friends with. But you're working with them, okay? So you've sort of all been thrown into this melting pot of an employer's together. Um, You've all got your necessary skills because otherwise you wouldn't be doing the job you're doing. But, um, yeah. But then you're dealing with so many right. different right. people from so we background. we don't have control over other people. We can't fix other people, <clears throat> you know. And this kind of gets into you know like what's in our control and what's not in our control, right? And what most people do is uh, what they rely on the most is trying to change somebody else or change a dysfunctional situation so that they don't have to feel uncomfortable. Right. If you would just stop being dysfunctional, then I wouldn't have to be uncomfortable. And unfortunately, a lot of the time that is not possible. Right. Um, So we have to learn, you know, other ways of um, of adapting. Right. And um, the thing that's 100 percent in our control. Right. Is how we cope with our emotions, how we cope cognitively, like our expectations, how we communicate. Um, how we regulate our emotions, uh, um, how we um, how we talk to ourselves, right? All of the things that we've talked about. There's so many things that are in our control. So even if somebody else, right, is dysfunctional, right, the the and we can't change that, right? We also don't have to internalize it. And allow ourselves to uh, let it affect how we cope, how we operate, how we see ourselves, you know. No, you're right. Because at the end of the day, you can't change other people, but you can actually, uh, you know, how you react to certain situations, uh, that's what you can change. You can change yourself, but you can't actually change other people. So you've got to be really And you can set boundaries. Yes. And that's a big one for women set boundaries and assert yourself. Um, I use that a lot with women because one of the things that I often hear with women is, I'll give you an example. So I was working with this one woman who, um, you know, was very unhappy in her marriage. Uh, To give you an example, you know, every weekend she would work a full week. And then on the weekend, she would spend all this time catching up on errands and chores while her husband every weekend would go off and go hunting or fishing or do whatever he wanted, right? And so we had talked about this and she'd been married to him for about 12, 14 years. Plus there was a lot of anger issues going on with, with him. And then one day she comes in and she goes, you know, I've been thinking about it and I put up with this for, you know, 12, 14 years, whatever it was, right. I can keep putting up with it. And I said, yeah, yeah, you can, but just because you can, doesn't mean you should. You have a choice. And right. And so that's one of the mantras that I came up with with women. It's like women are capable of putting up with a lot of things, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. And that is one of the big problems, both on on, on personal level and relationships, on the workplace, and also culturally, right? Um the the second so so then a lot of times the the sort of devil's advocate to that is well you know Elaine if I set boundaries or assert myself it's going to make things worse right in other words if I say no right then that person's going to get angry or you know uh, one of the one of the 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 best ones is with women it's like well if I don't do it nobody will right. You know, uh, the the things are going to go to hell in a handbasket. And I say, yes, you might be right, but that's because other people can't handle you setting boundaries and asserting yourself. In other words, the answer is not for you to continue to enable, right? It's to start, you know, to start setting boundaries and asserting yourself so that, you know, If and, you know, there's no guarantee, but other people, right, stop enabling other people to continue to 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 be dysfunctional because you're afraid 
of negative consequences. We have to remember we are not responsible just because there's a negative outcome and we know that we might be able to make a difference, right? Doesn't mean that we're responsible, nor are we being selfish. I feel like there's a whole other podcast that we need to do on this now. (laughs) (laughs) All I can say is to every woman out there, if you have a daughter, what would you say to them? There exactly. you go. Go back to be exactly. your own best friend. Exactly. Exactly. Look, Elaine, thank you so much You're welcome. Um, for coming on this thank podcast. You. And, you know, I feel like there's a whole different topic now that we've brought up that we need, need now need to cover off now, which is setting boundaries and not actually... Um, you know, and dealing with the consequences and the fears that are associated with setting boundaries, right? Because uh, you're right, you know, and I have I hear it all the time, like, you know, or oh, if I do, you know, like, I can't do that. It's been like that for 10, 15 years. I can't, you know, and I'm going, well, actually, you can. As you, if you don't want to live like that, that's your choice, right? You're making the choices of how you're right. living, right? So, therefore... Right. You either accept that you choose to live that way or you change it, right? Because you control the things that you can change, right? right? Um, Right. You can't control other people, but you can control what you're willing to accept. But look, that's a whole different podcast, I think. It's a whole (laughs) other podcast. I'll have to speak to you and we'll get you back on to talk about that. But look. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claire. You had a a lot of really good questions and comments that really – um, you know, fueled the conversation just where it needed to go. Yeah. You have a lot yeah. of insight into this. So thank you. And, and so if people want to find you, your website is um, www.mentallyspeaking, well, is it? Well, that is my blog. Um, that is a, a kind of a different animal. Um, a lot of it is politically oriented um, because it's a lot about, you know, uh, social issues but from a psychological perspective. Oh, right. right? Okay. okay. Um, and you've got your podcast. But I, but I have my podcast and um, we are getting up and running again soon. So I, I had recorded some last spring and, um, and we're going to start up again uh, very soon here. But it's called It's More Complicated Than You Think. Yeah. And, and so is. this is a perfect example of what I mean by that. Yeah. Definitely, that definitely. When you people please, you have to understand that it's more complicated than you think. And and if it were easy, you would have figured it out already. But we are much more complicated than we give ourselves credit for. So you can find that on Anchor or any of your other platforms. Okay. And then do, have you got like an actual website people can come and speak to you? Um, I would just say, uh, get on the podcast website. We're building it up. So hopefully. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, cool. Cool. I, I'm hoping soon yeah. that people will be able to call in or, 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 oh, uh, record, you know, questions or, or stories yeah. that they would like to see covered, share personal stories. That they would no, like that's to awesome. Covered. That's yeah. No, that would be really good. That would be really good. Look, Thank you again for coming on board with us. Um, It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Um, And, yeah, we'll get you back on to talk about setting boundaries. This is a big one for us single parents with our kids and with our ex-partners and with everyone in our life. So, yeah. And talking about embracing your humanity. We didn't get to that, but that's a big part. No, we didn't. We need to do that one. We definitely, we definitely do need to do that. Well, I'll be sending you a diary booking and we'll book in another session. It will be all good. Okay, cool. I'm going to let you get on with your evening. But thank you again. I think that's three times I've thanked you. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And, um, yeah, and we'll speak to you again soon. Great. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast and you would like to hear more, please hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts. If you would like to support us further, share this episode with your friends and family. And finally, drop us a review on iTunes as I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments and ideas. 
it all helps me to understand and produce awesome content you want to hear just like this. If you want to check out our past episodes, write to us, appear on the podcast, or for links, resources, and show notes, go to our website, www.strongsingleandhuman.com. We are also on all the usual social media platforms, Insta, Facey, and Twitter. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I hope to see you back here again soon. Be kind to yourself, and remember, no one is perfect. We're all just putting one foot in front of the other and doing our best. I'm Claire Martin, and you've been listening to the Strong, Single, and Human podcast. podcast.